current case because you had to read some. So let's talk about Gibson and Manchester City Council, 1979. How many of you have ever been to Manchester? So this is actually what it looks like, right? It's um, Although most of you, if you've been to Manchester and done it properly, you weren't awake during the day. So that's what it looks like during the day, just in case you're wondering. Um, so as was the case with a lot of cities in the UK, they developed uh, significant areas of public housing. And back in, uh, I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, oh, 1970, that's why I have slides. Uh, in 1970, the Manchester City Council had this policy of selling council houses to residents, so giving them the ability to buy their houses. And Mr Gibson uh, was a tenant in one of the houses and he applied to the council for information about the price and the terms, the mortgage terms. Uh, used loosely their mortgage terms is really talking about uh, the terms on which the council would finance the house for him. So basically he got this letter, a little bit difficult to read on the screen but it is in uh, the materials. It says from the council, dear sir, reference your purchase of the council house, sorry I have to get a bit close to make a look at it. Um, I don't really need to record my time with you, but there you go. Take the lawyer, timesheets away from the lawyer, but you can't stop the lawyer recording their time. It's a bad habit. Um, I refer to your request for the details of the cost of buying your council house. The corporation, so the city council, might be prepared to sell the house to you at the purchase price of, goodness me, <laughs> look at that number. Anyway, less 20%. Um, Maximum mortgage to the corporation, so we'll lend you £2,177 and you can pay it back over 20 years. Annual fire insurance on top, blah, blah, blah. If you wish to pay off some of the purchase price, so a bit more term and stuff like that. If you'd like to make a formal application to buy your council house, please complete the enclosed application form, yours faithfully, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so pretty formal letter sets out what the terms are, explains what's going on. Um, Gibson completed the form. He left out the purchase price and he signed the form which included the words, I now wish to purchase my council house. Um, and he returned it to um, the council on the 5th of March 1971, my husband's seventh birthday. Um, the issue was that in between the government or the, the council changed, they had an election, right? So the new council, they had a different policy. They thought, well, actually we've got all of these assets. We would rather own the assets rather than sell them. We're not going to privatise. Um, and so basically they shut down the process. And so Gibson said, well, actually that's not fair because I'd already filled out the paperwork, I want to buy my house. So it's confused in the case too by that use of my house because he lived in the house, he calls it his house, but clearly the house belonged to the council. So Mr Gibson argued that his return of that form constituted his acceptance and that because he had acceptance, a binding contract had been formed on the 5th of March 1971 and that it was legally enforceable. The council, on the other hand, uh, said, well, no. Oh, well, let's just work out what their arguments were in a second. So basically the court said that it is well settled and elementary, a well settled and elementary principle of English word, uh, English law, in other words, the law, this is not a complex case, the law applies and that this is how we work out whether there's a contract or not. So this is why you've got this case, so because you can see that analysis step by step. So the, what they did first is they looked at the handful of documents, the letter that had been sent, the application form, the communication. So what they did is they worked out, well, what are the material facts here? what are the pieces of paper and for reasons that we'll talk about later paper trumps 
people's memory of what's been said or done. But what are the pieces of paper that somebody might argue, Gibson might argue, are the contract and do they actually form an offer that has been accepted and that acceptance has been communicated? So let's just have another look at the letter and I've highlighted a couple of things here. In particular, this language. The corporation, so the council, may be prepared to sell the house to you. The corporation may grant you a mortgage over that, for that amount of money over that period of time. Importantly, this letter should not be regarded as a firm offer of the mortgage firm offer of finance. If you would like to make a formal application to buy your council house, please complete the enclosed application form. Notice it's called an application form and return it as soon as possible. So what do we think? Is there an application? Is there an offer? If there is an offer, who's made it? And if there is an offer, has it been accepted? Any of my learned friends here like to represent the council and make an argument as to why they shouldn't have to sell his house? I'm trying to work out who are the dark side people. Who are the people who are going to be commercial? There you are, right down the back. What's your name? Tino. 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 Nice to meet you. Tell us nice and loudly, my learned friends. I'm going to have to come closer to you. You have a very, very tiny voice for a very tall person. <laughs> um, there's no contract here because it was just an invitation to consider. No contract here because there's just an invitation to consider. Yes. So can you just explore that? Who's making the invitation? The council is making the invitation to um, Mr Gibson. Mr. Gibson, so what then would, how would you classify the nature of the correspondence that Mr. Gibson sends back to the council? Well, he did not um, assert the price that... He didn't assert the price? Um, ..that he was going to also consider buying the property for. So is that why there's no contract? Because there's he no, didn't assert a price? There's no contract because the council was still, you know, they may sell the property. Yeah and you have to apply, it's an application, it's not... Um... So, at, at risk of... I, I want you to be really precise here, so if I've not put the right words in your mouth, because I'm going to use the language slightly differently, you would argue that the council had not made an offer. Yes. That, but potentially what I'm also hearing is that Gibson also didn't make an offer that the application he made couldn't be an offer because it didn't have a price in it. That's it was omitting a separate detail. That's correct. So now somebody here had their hand up or oh, do you agree, disagree, would you like to reinforce? I agree. I was going to say that I think that um, the council has essentially laid out the terms and they're asking him to make an offer. So for those of you who didn't hear, sorry, Anna. Anna. Uh, so Anna's saying she agrees with Tino's um, analysis that the council is effectively inviting him to make an offer, that the letter is at best an invitation to treat. So don't know what I'm doing here. Is there anyone who disagrees with that analysis? Because effectively the court agrees with the analysis. How do we know he doesn't make an offer? Like, how do we know the application form doesn't ask what you are willing to Okay, pay? that is a really good question. Sorry, what's your name? Marius. Marius is saying, how do we know he didn't make an offer? Um, I'm going to actually even change that slightly again. Does it matter at this point whether he made an offer or not? The question that we are asking is, is there an enforceable contract? So the only time it matters whether he made an offer or not is if there is some other piece of paper or evidence that we haven't seen yet that would suggest that the council had accepted that offer. Because it's only when we've got the offer and an acceptance that match. Now, the reason I know he didn't make an offer is exactly the point that Tino made, but then I know more about contract law than you do yet. <laughs> but that if that application could be framed as an offer, and maybe it could, it was actually missing a material issue. So because he hadn't actually put in the price. Now that's something 
again, this is why we go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, but it was lacking certainty and completeness because a material term, the actual price that he is prepared to pay um, and also how much he needed to borrow and whether he had finance were missing. You told me your name just a minute ago. It's Imogen. Oh my goodness, that was so random. I had no idea whether that was going to be true or not. Imogen, what you, would you like to say here? I, I was going to say, this is slightly tangential, but given that it was a letter inviting him to fill out a form and return it, and then obviously subsequently there's been an election and therefore that form has been voided, is that it's an issue in its own right in that they're encouraging so him just to I walked over to Imogen and so her voice just got softer, Sorry. which was my mistake. But Imogen's saying, well, actually, is it... Oh, now, how do I actually summarise what you were saying? Um, is it that because he's, been, he's made that offer and then there's been this other change, effectively a question's going to the fairness of it, isn't it? Is it? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I guess the idea that, like, is it OK for people to make offers that invite you to apply for something that is then voided without you knowing? Is it okay for somebody to make an invitation and then change the rules is effectively what you're saying without him knowing, necessarily knowing. Um, can I spin that question around a little bit and ask you, thinking as lawyers, think as if you were acting for the council why would you set it up this way? Why wouldn't you? I mean, Mr Gibson's not a lawyer. My guess is most people who live in council housing in Manchester are not lawyers. Let's assume that they've set it up in this way on purpose. They've said, they're not saying, do you want to buy your house? If you do, this is how much it will cost. This is what the mortgage will be. They've actually gone to some lengths to even use these words here. Um, if you would like, uh, where is it? This letter should not be regarded as a for, firm offer of a mortgage. Why would you, as a lawyer, advise them to set it up that way? I'll go here first, Can. Sorry, your name again? Tiffany. Tiffany. Because if you put an offer out, the power is with the offeree. If you put an offer out, the power is with the offeree. So when you are the counsel, I'm going to sell you this house for a bit more than 2,000 quid and you're going to borrow a bit more than 2,000 quid from me to do that. I want to know that you can pay me back, right? You've, if I make you the offer and say I'll lend you this money and you've got, you can buy the house and all you have to do is say yes, I am then obliged because we've made a contract. I haven't even had the chance yet to work out whether or not you're going to be good to pay me that money back. A little bit tangential, but since that is a legal document, why does it say regarded as a firm offer of a mortgage? Because you said that it would be Mr Gibson who would offer the mortgage. Yeah, well, it's saying it's not a firm offer of a mortgage. Yeah, so what he's doing, they're saying is effectively what, what they are trying to do is swap it around because the person who gets... The, receives the offer is the one who has the power. Back in the 80s when people used to sign documents, I used to do a lot of uh, infrastructure transactions and back then the Japanese basically owned everything and they would come to Australia to do these massive deals and often you would have these really, really complex contracts that had been negotiated over months and months and months and the day before anybody signed the contracts what would happen is sort of the little paralegals and the most junior lawyers from each side would go through page by page by page and check that the paper documents matched exactly the final versions of the negotiations as they had been reached. And then you would put everything into boxes and tape them and seal them up so you could see if they'd been tampered with the next morning. And then you would have the signing ceremony, you know, like you see Donald Trump with everybody around him and the swapping of the pens. But literally, everybody had come in and the two um, heads of companies who would be signing, they would kind of look at each other and it was almost like this ready, set, go, and they would sign at the same time. Because as soon as one has signed, if the other one hasn't signed, the other one has all the power. Right, so it's literally, we used to do it that way. It was just, and it's, it's just a byproduct of the way that this power dynamic works. 
Um, so the court said the words may be prepared to sell and if you would like to make a formal application, a formal offer to buy, in the letter make it impossible to construe the letter as a contractual offer. And it is effectively, I think somebody used the word invitation earlier, it is an invitation to treat. It's saying we are initiating a negotiation with you. The letter and the application form simply set out the financial terms on which the council may be prepared to consider a sale and purchase in due course. No contract. Da -dum. But the other part of this question, and we've toyed with it in the conversation, is whether the decision was fair. And I think that Lord Diplock's part of the judgment is helpful here. Whether one thinks this makes a it a hard case perhaps depends on the political views that one holds about the council housing policy. But hard cases offer a strong temptation to let them have their proverbial consequences. It is a, a, a temptation that the judicial mind must be vigilant to resist. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, there are benefits for society and for economies for contracts to be enforced the same way all the time, for the rules to be approached in a particular way. But doesn't necessarily mean it's fair. So this is where it, it is quite okay to think, actually, this is a really mean decision. Like a guy who lives in a council house, he thinks he's got to fill in these forms. It's quite clear on the bits of paper how much money it's going to cost him and what his obligations are going to be. He thinks he's going to get to buy his house. And because of some law that nobody has ever told him about, he's missed out. Didn't get any advice along the way. Why would he? It's not set out. It doesn't say you should, you should speak to a lawyer before you sign this. He just thought he was going to get his house. And it's not an unreasonable thing to think. Mm -hmm.